Hello world, what is a digital red cross and could it stop cyber attacks? Crypto stealing malware gets an upgrade and the feds seize a billion dollars in crypto from the Silk Road hacker. That's all coming up in today's roundup of cybersecurity tech news. Everyone knows what the Red Cross is. In wartime, it's painted on the sides of trucks, tents and people, all to let your enemy know that these are medics, so please don't shoot them. Anything bearing this symbol is protected under the Geneva Convention, or at least that's the idea. But now, medical services have a new threat they need to deal with, cyber warfare and cybercrime. And I don't imagine painting Red Crosses on the back of laptops is going to deter hackers. Whilst many cybercriminals do pledge not to target healthcare organizations, malware doesn't necessarily know who it's infecting and will just lock up the computer of whoever is unfortunate enough to download it. So a new report has been published on digitalizing the Red Cross, as in how can a computer let malware know that it's medical related and to please leave it alone. It seems like a digital Red Cross would be a relatively easy thing to implement. I mean, similar things already exist. Say for example, you want to let Google know that you'd rather they didn't crawl your website. You'd just create a robots.txt file in the root directory, inside which you mark it as disallowed. So there could be something similar in this case, redcross.txt the very existence of which would let hackers know that the computer is medical related. I mean, sure, anyone could have used this by creating the TXT on their own computer, but anyone can wear an armband, so this isn't a new problem. But there is another major downside with this solution, and it's not what you might think. If an attacker hacks a computer and tries to check for the existence of this file, the victim computer could detect this access attempt and would therefore know it's under attack. This would mean that pretty much all organizations, regardless of whether they're medical related, would keep tabs on whether the existence of this file is being checked for. If it is, then they'd know they're being attacked and would lock down their systems. Consequently, hackers just wouldn't want to check for the file, which makes the whole point of it redundant. So for hackers to be willing to check for a digital Red Cross, it needs to be designed around their needs. They need to be able to look for it without raising alarm bells. This is crucial. The report has several ideas about how this could be implemented. A solution could be DNS based, as in a new top level domain specifically for healthcare organizations. But DNS isn't immune to people messing with it, and the organization's domain might not even be visible from all the computers in the network. A second idea is IP based. Medical organizations could submit the IP addresses they use to a neutral third party, which could compile and publish a list of all the IPs that people should leave alone. But thanks to network address translation, there could be a huge number of devices hiding behind a single public IP. So how do you know that these are all medical systems and some bad actor isn't just exploiting this virtual shield? You don't, and well, that's the thing. A digital Red Cross is much more tricky to implement than it seems. Whilst the report doesn't give a definitive answer on how this could be solved, it settles on what's being called an Authenticated Digital Emblem, or ADEM for short, which would mean an organization digitally signing the traffic their network generates on certain protocols, so bad actors would be able to tell whether a target is healthcare related with a simple ping. Whether this actually works in practice, well, we'll have to wait and see. This whole idea has hasn't even left the white paper yet, it still needs to be prototyped. Clipboard hijacking malware is evolving. A new variant has been discovered, which comes with an interesting feature. And if you don't know what this kind of malware is, you definitely should. This malware is simple, but sneaky. And if you're not careful, it could cost you a bunch of crypto. And unfortunately, I do have a few experiences with this kind of malware, but we'll get to that in a sec. If you're not familiar, clipboard hijacking malware exploits the fact that when making a crypto payment, you'll usually copy the payment address before pasting it into your wallet. So this kind of malware simply monitors everything you copy to your clipboard and will compare it against a bunch of regular expressions matching crypto wallet addresses. If it finds a match, it'll replace that kind of crypto address with one of its own. So when you hit paste, you end up sending your crypto to cyber criminals by mistake. It really is one of the sneakiest kinds of malware out there. And like I say, I've had a couple run-ins with it. So I run an online store, maltronics.com, where I sell various pen testing devices and I accept payments in crypto. I've had numerous instances of confused and sometimes angry customers emailing me to say they paid for their order, but the payments page just doesn't acknowledge it. In one case, a customer told me, I think there's something wrong with your Coinbase payments webpage. When you click copy the ETH address, the address is different every time. 
a clear sign that this person's computer is infected. They then listed a bunch of these addresses that appeared on their clipboard each time they hit copy. And by searching these addresses on Etherscan, you'll see they've received thousands of dollars in payments. There's even comments from people saying they sent their crypto to this address by mistake, not realizing that their mishap was actually the result of malware. And to add insult to injury, people are responding to these comments saying that if you get in touch with a certain email, they should be able to reverse your transaction, but they charge for this service, which is of course just another scam. In what seems to be a case of the same cyber criminals behind the malware, double dipping. However, clipboard hijacking malware is relatively easy to counter. After you've pasted an address, just make sure the last few characters match the address you've copied. And there you go, job done. But new malware, which goes by the name Laplace, changes this. This malware is similar to any other malware. It's sold on hacker forums via a subscription of $59 per month. In return, cyber criminals get a web interface where they can generate an executable, view their infections, as well as their crypto wallets. But it has a unique feature, which has made it increasingly popular amongst cyber criminals. Laplace makes sure to replace wallet addresses with an address where the last few characters are identical, dramatically increasing the chance that even if you checked these last few characters, you wouldn't notice that it's a completely different address. And this is a significant upgrade for cyber criminals. But exactly how the developers implemented this feature is still a bit of a mystery. I mean, generating a Bitcoin address with a certain string on the end could take a few seconds depending on a victim's hardware, potentially longer than it'd take a victim to paste the address. So it's possible the developers used a tool like VanityGen to pre-compute billions of wallet addresses, and then they just substitute them in as needed. Either way, next time you paste a crypto address, save yourself some coins by skimming through the whole thing. In 2012, Silk Road, the internet's most notorious dark web marketplace, was hacked. 50,000 Bitcoin were stolen in a robbery which was made possible due to a withdrawal processing flaw in Silk Road systems. You see, every time someone withdrew their crypto from the marketplace, there was a bit of lag before their balance was updated, which was eventually exploited by someone who made a series of withdrawals in rapid succession, extracting in total 50,000 Bitcoin, making this one of the largest crypto heists of all time time. But the hacker was never identified, and just a year later, the Silk Road was shut down, its owner, Ross Ulbricht, imprisoned, and the heist remained a mystery. Until now. The DOJ, using what they describe as state-of-the-art cryptocurrency tracing and good old-fashioned police work, have identified and arrested the hacker, one James Song. And you might be a little confused as to why the DOJ are spending their time and resources investigating decade-old instances of criminal-on-criminal -criminal hacks. Well, at the time of the heist, the haul was only worth a few hundred thousand dollars. I say only because in September of 2012, Bitcoin was at $12 a coin. However, things have changed a bit since then, and the small fortune is now a much larger fortune, roughly a billion dollars, which will now presumably become the property of the government for them to auction off. James Zong's home was raided, and as expected, the feds found a literal treasure trove. Stacks of cash, bars of silver and gold, even physical Bitcoin. These things are called cassatious coins. Coming in various denominations, they have a sticker you can peel off to reveal a private key. But of course, the big seizure was the 50,000 Bitcoin, which court documents say was found on a single board computer, which I'm just going to go ahead and assume was a Raspberry Pi, as it isn't specified. I'm guessing this was the micro SD card that the Pi was using to store the fortune. It was found in a popcorn tin, which was apparently hidden in his bathroom closet. Funnily enough, on the exact day of the raid, November 9th last year, Bitcoin was just hitting its all-time high of 68,000 USD, meaning this micro SD card was worth in excess of $3 billion. But of course, Bitcoin has had a bit of a rough time since then, so the feds won't get quite so much for it at auction. And unfortunately for James Zong, it's pretty hard to explain away a multi-billion dollar crypto fortune hidden in a bathroom closet. And so he's pled guilty on charges which could land him in prison for 20 years. This video was made possible by Linode, who are giving you a $100 60-day credit just for signing up. Linode is essentially your Swiss army knife for cloud computing. If it runs on Linux, it'll run on Linode. 
One great feature of Linode is their app marketplace, which makes it super easy to spin up servers with pre-configured software. Use Linode's Kali Linux app to quickly spin up a fresh instance of Kali. The installer makes it easy to configure the basics, like VNC passwords, whether you want a desktop environment, and so on. Linode can run almost anything by providing all the tools a developer really needs at competitive prices. Use the link in the description now to claim your free $100. If you found this video interesting, make sure to hit that subscribe button and I'll see you in the next video. Have a good one.